I've been doing a quick review of some of the video series that we've been doing and that we've been teaching and probably promoting and sharing and caring and daring to explain out some of the things that maybe you feel frustrated about because you don't get the opportunity to talk to the pastor or maybe you feel intimidated because you don't get the chance to teach the teacher or to talk to the teacher. Well, I thought of those thoughts, so maybe I might bring them out when I'm teaching and maybe when I'm reaching or when I'm preaching because the reality of what we do most of the time when we go to church is we sit back and let someone preach at us. And that's what they do, preach. Because you see, a teaching ministry would be something that would involve participation on our part, which the realization of what we should be doing isn't always the accomplishment of the purpose and the design with which church was intended to be. Because really what the people did at one time was that they lived together, they worked together, they played together, they had communication together so that they would be taking what was maybe shared or said, let's just use it in modern days. Let's pick something that we can identify with and make personal application now before we even get into the scriptures. God help us. But picture this if you will. Y'all work at the same job. You get that? Okay, first of all, you all live in the same city, so everybody's living pretty close together. You know, you're on the same block. And in the West, the Wild West, it was like that. You were on the same block. <laughs> you didn't live far away if you are in the city. A lot of Mormon towns are set up that way, and a lot of other towns are set up that way. They're structured, you know, in such a way. Matter of fact, Russian Orthodox closed communities, they will build a church, and then they will buy the houses, and they will put you in a house and you will live denominationally within that structure. The same thing is true in orthodoxy, but it's more of a, there's a certain parameter of land and uh, space, we'll say, that's been cordoned off that is only so far away from what we would call a Sabbath day journey. And so the orthodox Jews, certain types of orthodoxy in Judaism, will live within that boundaries of that assembly or that shul, that uh, you could say synagogue, that gathers together and they won't move out from it. Mea Sharim in Israel has the very same issues and the same problem. People live right there next to their assembly of where they gather together to hear the rabbi speak and they don't go any farther. They don't let anybody in either. It's kind of an interesting thing. But picture, if you will, not that, but this. You're following Jesus and you're living with Jesus and you're learning from him and you spend all your time with him and that really you don't have any time apart from him except when he sends you out to go do an errand. You would learn a lot about Jesus that way, wouldn't you? You would begin to eat like he eats, maybe. You would drink like he drinks. You know, you'd eat the same food, drink the same thing. You know, you'd be participating in the same lifestyle. You would be like Jesus and that's what it used to be like and that's what church is meant to be. Now, at some point in time, obviously, you know, it kind of got a little fractured and fractured and, you know, kind of went far out and got bigger and mega and, you know, all the other things that it does. But here's the way that it was existing at one point in time was that if you lived in a city, you participated with, you know, your butcher was probably you went to the Christian butcher. Well, in those days, Jewish butcher. What can I say? But you went to the person you knew and you trusted him because there wasn't the FDA and there wasn't the... ADA or there wasn't the you know government taking over or anybody else making sure that you got you know one pound ten ounces of burger meat or you got sixteen ounces of you know something that resembled what you thought you were getting but really they slapped it all together and you don't know what parts the animal came from well no I mean that's not happening except in modern days but in those days you trusted the person you dealt with you had interaction you had a relationship with that person and that's what church was. It was a relationship of people gathered together that had things in common. The early church began that way in the book of Acts when they sold all things and had everything in common in Jerusalem. They didn't have it that way quite the same way when you know, the Gentile church that began to come involved later as Paul went out into the, the rest of the world into the uttermost parts that he had already lived in and been part of but he'd gone out to these places too. And now he was going on journeys, you know, to take the gospel where God had said and, said and sent him by the Spirit of God. But the point being is this. Relationships were established. People saw each other. They talked to each other. They knew what the other person lived, what they did, how they acted, how they related to each other. So it would make more sense then the things they were going through because you couldn't ignore your brother who was hungry. 
You knew he was hungry, so of course you gave him food. You knew he was thirsty, so of course you brought him to drink. I mean, you know, the harlots, everybody knew where the harlots were. And in some ways, gossip today handles that same situation, doesn't it? You know more than you admit you know about certain people or about certain situations in your family of faith or in your community or in your congregation even. So the reality of what was going on at one point in time in that with which God was doing was to bring people together so that they would become one in the Spirit like Jesus prayed for his disciples. They would become one as the Father and the Son was one. But he only did it with twelve. You see, it wasn't necessarily going to happen to everyone everywhere all at the same time. It was a process of development. It was a changing, a discipling, if you will, a growing. Even Jesus' own brethren didn't accept him until after he rose from the dead. And matter of fact, they probably still had doubts then. They were sort of wondering, well, wait a minute, we're all messed up. And then once the Holy Spirit came, we're told that he would reveal truth. And we take for granted much of what we think we know. Really, God is making us to know. And we have more pride in our intellect then we really recognize how much of inspired we are in just our thought process. Because how could they not know is a big question you often ask, or most people do, when they look at some of the things that are said to the disciples. They didn't have the Spirit of God. There's a good reason why they did not know, and it's not just because they were so politically minded. These are people that were, hey, they're Jewish. Let's be real. They're not stupid. They're not ignorant people. They're intellectually smart. They're, they have intelligence. There's a capability to make connections, just like we do. But except that there be the Spirit of God working within a man, hey, I could speak till the cows come home. And people won't even recognize that there are cows coming home. Hello? You know, even if they mooed, they'd wonder it was a car or something. I met people like that. You know, they still don't think we went to the moon. Oh, well, they probably think a cow jumps over it. But knowing that these things were relational that interrelationships were things that were causing these people to grow closer together in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that's one of the things that we need to do when we're examining the scriptures. We need to have a relationship of thinking about them, considering them, pondering them, talking about them, relating to them, making them a part of our life before we just run on and run off and run away with, oh, let's jump to the next part of the Bible. Let's hurry up and get our, oh, well, we're in the book of James now, so let's grab James 1, you know, 2, and go through 7, you know, and we're just going to like, man, we've got an agenda. we got to get going because, you know, I don't care if you got it. I don't care if you've learned it. I don't care if you know it. I only care I go through it. You're on your own after that, buddy. Suffer, sucker. Ha! You think that's teaching? You know, lecture system? Do you really think the lecture system works? Do you think preaching is the opportune means with which we should be making available the Word of God as living and alive as Jesus being the personification of the very Bible we hold in our hands and the recognition of that with which we are sharing isn't so much about, oh, well, I spent you know three hours and four hours a week, the whole week on studying and preparing for this message so that I can make you dump on you my message and chump on you about you didn't get it. Chump change? What's the matter with you? Man, I spent like hours on this and you don't get it in five minutes? You've been sitting there for a half hour listening to me and you don't get it? Hey, I've been working on it, man. Come on. Get a grip, buddy. You should be on it. You should be with it. You should be knowing it. No. One of the things that we like to talk about, as I said, in video especially in Bible studies with Vidibo. If you come into any of the Bible studies that you'll see that we talk about, that which we're learning about, that you may have made real in your life by the Spirit of God teaching you, is I will share my frustrations I've learned through the years from all these great men of God that, quite frankly, didn't tell me squat about learning. Well, they told me what they learned. They didn't tell me anything about what I was learning. As a matter of fact, I even came to one of them, Chuck Smith, one time and said, which blessed me because he was the one that inspired me to go on with my learning, was that I didn't agree with him. 
I mean, I, I was listening to Bible study, you know, and it was like, man, I was barely saved, you know. I'd only been saved for about a year or something, something like that. I'd only been going to Calvary less than that. But, you know, I was kind of like, wow, you know. So I decided to come up after the service. And Chuck used to be up back behind the service, you know, after especially Sunday night, which is when I used to go, you know. Chuck used to say the spiritual people go Sunday night because Sunday morning was for the sinners. Sunday night was for those that were, you know, getting to know the Lord and wanted to grow, you know, wanted to be close and intimate with God. I was like, yeah. You know, so I was always down on the floor, down at the floorboards, you know. I was like, I wouldn't even sit in pews. I'd go lay down on the carpet, you know. But the problem was that every time Chuck started teaching, I'd go off on a tangent. <laughs> oh, well. So we were talking about Ezekiel 42.20 one time, you know, and he was talking about, you know, how the temple in those days, you know, because Hal was around, you know, and, and Mister was around, everybody was around, everybody was talking about the end times, you know, and how... At that point in time, everybody was saying the Dome of the Rock has to be destroyed and that the destruction of the Dome of the Rock was going to bring on the Battle of Armageddon and the Valley of Megiddo, you know, and all that stuff. And it just didn't sound right to me. You know, I kept thinking, why would God tear down a building in order to start a war? You know, I mean, I just, I, I just didn't get it. You know, it just didn't make any sense to me. I just was kind of like, nah, because I'd been studying prophecy a little bit. And maybe you're one of those guys that think the Dome of the Rock, you know, is sitting right on top of the very, very stones that, oh my God, it's the pillar. The Holy of Holies was right here. Yeah, right, sure, okay, fine. Oh, I think it's in heaven, buddy. <laughs> you know, that's why it was in Shiloh. That's why it went to the Moabites one time. That's why it was on the back of a donkey. That's why it was carried and tipped over one time. I mean, come on now. You know, we, we don't want to get too holy about some of the ground that we're talking about. It's been moved all over the place. <laughs> wherever God is, is where the Holy of Holies is. And the Holy of Holies is where God is. So, put it bluntly, you got the Holy of Holies in you, if Jesus is in you. So, I don't know if you can understand that or fathom that yet, but, you know, sooner or later, that'll click in. But that's just a freebie to think about. Think about it for a while. It's kind of like, you know, it makes sense, maybe. If it doesn't, come back and ask me, you know, I'll talk. But... In studying the scriptures, you know, you never get the opportunity to really say, I, I don't get it. So I was going up to Chuck, you know, and I was going, I told him, you know, I, I looked at, you know, he was standing there and he's saying, you know, because everybody comes in line and they say this, you know, you know, he had his Bible and he opens his Bible and, you know, tell, tell a person, because usually he's telling someone, counseling, really, is what it was bound to. But I came up and I said, you know, Chuck, I said, I don't know, you know, I said, I, I'm still studying, but I said, is it possible that maybe, like, you know, because then I started backpedaling. Is it possible that maybe that it's, you know, might have been a new piece of, you know, in 20 ways of backpedaling, um, that in Ezekiel 42.20 that God doesn't have to destroy the Dome of the Rock, but that he could put a wall of separation between the holy place and the profane, and that the profane would be the Dome of the Rock, and, and that he could build the temple right next to it? And Chuck opens it up and he says, he looks and he says, Ezekiel 42.20, and he's looking and he goes, looks at me and he says it's possible he says I'll have to look at it. he says I'll have to study that and he thanked me he says thank you he says I'm, I'm going to look that up and I just walked away going yeah. you know and I didn't know you know I mean later on I did a well okay that night and for the next three days staying up I did a massive study I had aerial surveys I had satellite images I had everything lined out about the mountaintop of, your, of the Temple Mount you know, and I made my case <laughs> Oh boy, and that was back in the 70s, you know, and man, I had it down. I had everybody's, you know, like, this guy's version of where the temple should be, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, all of them from way back in the 1800s even, you know, I mean, it was like, you know, and I was like scoping out all these pictures and all these schematics, and I had everything laid out. I mean, those days, you could still get to it, you got to the university, you know, and it was like, USNET, but you know, and I was on AOL, so it was like, you know, kind of popular at those times. But, man, I was thrilled because it taught me to not just ask questions, but to expect to see that everyone's learning. Because a few years later, when Chuck got back to Ezekiel 42.20, he previously had said that he didn't know. The next time he went through, he said, it's possible. And the next time he went through, when he came to it, he said, he didn't believe that the Dome of the Rock was going to be destroyed, but that there would be a separation between. And I just went, wow. I was blessed. Because at that time, nobody was teaching that there would be a wall of separation between the two. Nobody was saying, even Chuck Misser wasn't saying that, you know, it could be built somewhere else. They were saying, smack dab right in the middle, tear it down, destroy it. <laughs> you know, I wasn't so sure about that. So it's kind of neat that, you know, 
God can use a donkey, and He could use even me, you know, on little portions of Scripture, that He can use you where you are, the way you are, studying, and maybe give you some insight into some little tiny piece of the puzzle that'll make you so inspired that you'll learn about all the other pieces of the puzzle and employ them in your faith, in your relationship with God. Because that's what we do when we look at the Scriptures. We don't take one Scripture and say, oh, Psalm 83, this is a war. Or take one out of context. Ezekiel 42, 20, you know, and that's, oh, there's a wall, you know. We don't take one portion of Scripture, but we look at the volume of the book from Genesis through Revelation. The reason why we study line upon line, precept upon precept, isn't because it says so in the Old Testament, and it does say so. But they were being bad-mouthed by the prophet when he said, oh, you put line upon line, a precept upon precept, because what they do is they took a line and they put a precept, and they took a line and put a precept. They would take a line and make a commentary, take a line and make a commentary. Line upon line, precept upon precept. The prophets were bad-mouthing them for literally not doing what we say we do when we claim to be literalists. Now, some people will say, oh, you know, I'm a literalist, and then I'll, they'll say, but, you know, and then you'll get some place where, you you know, it's a spiritual application. They'll say, well, you're not a literalist there, are you? And they'll say, no, I am. I'm a literalist. Man, you may not understand it how, but I'll get you. <laughs> you want to come to me and talk to me about literal? I'm the most literal literalist that you'll ever meet because literally I'm a literalist, and there isn't anything that I won't take literal when it comes to the Word of God. And I will fight you tooth and nail all the way down to the... Toes on your nose or the toes of the, the, the nails on your toes to the hairs on your head. Man, I'll go there because guess what? Jews have done that before, you know. They have been literal on it, you know, and they've been on spiritual on it, and they've been in all these different ways on it. Because I believe that you can be all these different ways and come up with the answer that God wants, and God covers all of them in the fullness of the volume of the book in all ways. Now, you don't know how that could be, but I do, and I have a very fun time explaining that at times when I get into what's called integral specificity and the recognition of there being more than just systematic theology. There can be a theology that's called integral specificity where it is what it is, the way it is, as it is. You know, and such is the design that God put it there for a specific purpose and a reason and the design is that God is the designer and God is the inspirer so it is specifically there for a purpose. Now, you may not know what the purpose is. I may not know what the purpose is. God knows what the purpose is, but we observe it and we accept it. Not by faith. We accept it because God said it. So what God said, God did. And that makes the Bible literal. And it makes the Bible, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, bluntly. And I'm it when it comes to that literalness of the Word and the Scriptures. And such as they are, they are, where they are, the way they are. I don't take one portion and throw it out of context. I keep it in the context of where it's at, and I can still apply it in context from where that's at and make it applicable to both. That's just something that I do. You know, it's kind of a habit, hobby. Or you could say that it's the word of truth. But the point is, is this. Since the Holy Spirit is the one teaching us, we shouldn't be the one preaching only. We should be the one comparing our notes. We should be saying, hey, I was studying the Word of God, you know, and I got, you know, a conclusion that I wasn't so sure of. So I want to ask you, what do you think about this? Now, some of you may say, well, that sounds like Francis Chan. Well, yeah, I stole it from him. <laughs> uh, when I came across Francis Chan, I went, dude, <laughs> where have you been all my life? I'm kidding. He, you know, he has a good perspective. He, he, he says, hey, you know, I don't, you know, this book, he'll go, this book. He says, we're studying and we don't know as much as we think we know. So we need to learn from each other. You know, I study and I, I share with you what I learned, but, you know, if you got something, come up here and talk to me. You know, we need to learn it together. Let's find out together what it means. I, you know, I don't have all the answers. This has all the answers. And he just is so right about the way that he talks and the way that he personifies that with which we should be when it comes to teaching. Now, you know, you may like or not like Francis Chan for other reasons, but me personally... <laughs> just like I like Chuck and I like Greg for his way of evangelism and things you know I don't go for Greg for other reasons but I go to Greg for evangelism or I like you know Mike for prayer you know I like Rawl for oh boy you know almost like a Romaine you know slap down knock down you know kind of beat you to death with you know kind of some of the things when you need to repent um, John Corson for whoa <laughs> you know I mean talk about wow and, um, you know, a lot of other people miss her for his, you know, capabilities of throwing everything out there like spaghetti 
or everything out there like the alphabet and you get to figure out which one's real and which one he's playing with you with your mind on which is fallacy and fact in other words so I have lots of people that I learn from but I compare them you know I compare the notes I, I sit down and I ask Holy Spirit okay what do you want to make applicable to me what's real at this moment in time as I'm understanding it with my limited knowledge because we're going to read here in the scriptures very quickly where we should go for when we need to know something. When you need to know, you should go back to the Word of God. And the Word of God literally is God, so we need to go back to God to find out what the Word of God is about. Because if we don't go to God for what the Word of God says, then we're never going to know what God's Word is because it's God who said it in the first place. So literally, what we need to do is go to the horse's mouth. And that's why we're going to study in James, not as one preaching to you, but as provoking you, invoking in you that desire to look at it and to say, hey, there's more here than you realize. There's a hell of a lot more and a heaven lot and a heavenly and a heavenful, a hell of a lot more and a heaven full of capabilities of understanding with which we can come to a conclusion and lift each other up to that heavenly place where we can listen to the word of God as it being spoken to us to our hearts making us conformable to the image of his son that even God the father revealed to the son things he didn't know so if Jesus didn't know and God the father is going to reveal it then guess what we could come together and ask the father to reveal it to us by the Holy Spirit and Jesus will intercede on our behalf and he'll say look I've been where they're at God tell them Fill them. Let them know. And we could learn. Such a deal. Hey, that's James. Because you see, James is writing to Jews. And so we're going to get into some real interesting issues right off the bat. And you can find out who James is and all that, brother Jesus, and argue about that and do whatever. Or you can find out James was somebody else and you see what the commentary is saying or whatever. I'm just going to say James is James and James is James. This is who James is. The Bible says, James, a servant of God. Hey, I got my answer. Oh, I don't know what your answer is. My answer is James. He's a servant of God. Who is James? James was a servant of God. Why? Because the Bible says so. Well, what else do I need to know? I don't need to know anything else. I only need to know what's in here. Why do I want to know everything else? Do I want to know background material, you know, circumstances, situations, you know, provocations, you know, in, interpretations and realizations of what was going on at the time that James had a headache, you know, and he wrote it down? No. I don't know what he was like. I didn't know the man. But I do know this. I know the word. And I know the book is called James. And I know the word in James 1.1, 1, 1, which really isn't 1.1 1, 1 because we don't even know if there was a number there because there really wasn't numbers and there wasn't chapters. So let's just get into it and say, hey, we're going to accept it where it's written as it's written the way it's written. But in James 1.1, 1, 1, we're going to go through a few verses and then we're going to like kind of like look at it and go, hmm. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith produces patience, or work of patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Cool! Let's start at the end. Let's work backwards, because we're upside down people anyways. You know, we never got it right. We always got it upside down. So let's start from the back end to work to the fore end. If any of you lack wisdom, whoa, hello, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally. Okay, do you lack wisdom? Yes or no? Your yes is yes, or your no is no. You're not in between. Well, I got some wisdom. No, you don't. Do you lack? Well, yeah, I guess I do. If you think about it, you know you do. So you lack wisdom. So let him ask God. So ask God. Don't ask me. Don't ask your pastor. Don't ask your leader. Don't ask your deacon. Don't ask your elders. Don't ask your you know council of 70 and 120 and get together and decide to pick another disciple. Ask God. He speaks. At least that's what we're looking around at. Didn't God speak and the world come into creation? Let there be light. Do I see light? Yeah, there's light out there. Let there be day and night. Oh, there's day and night. Let there be birds in the air. Oh, there's birds in the air. No, oh, let there be fowls. There's fowl. You know, there's trees. Well, there's me. I guess when God speaks, things happen. I guess God spoke and God speaks. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Huh. Wow. So, ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. What's he going to hold back? 
How liberal is liberal? Well, it ain't conservative. Liberally. We don't need to go into word studies. Liberally is liberally. You know that? Give me a little liberal gravy and you just pour the gravy on. Hey, I want wisdom, man. I want it liberally. So I go to God. I don't get like, you know, some man's interpretation or some commentary about this little dissertation or I don't get some kind of explanation. I get wisdom. Hello? So you can get man's ideas or you can get God's wisdom liberally given to you because it's given to all men if they ask God. Didn't Jesus say something like that? Ask. One of the first things he says in the Sermon on the Mount, which really is the teachings of Jesus, these sayings of mine, Jesus called his own quote-unquote Sermon on the Mount. Those aren't things of the kingdom. Those aren't just for someplace else. Those aren't whatever. Jesus said they're for now. This is what I'm about. This is what I do. This is what I say unto you. You have heard it said, but I say unto you. And at the end of the sermon, he says, these sayings of mine, then he tells you what to do with them. He says, look, if you do them, you're blessed. You'll have a big house. You know, your house will stand in storms and everything else. If you don't, your house is on sand, man. You're losing it. You're blowing it. You try to make this figurative and not literal. You try to play around with this and not say that these are these sayings of mine and I mean it. What are you doing? Who are you talking to? I'm God, the Son of God, the Son of Man. I've come here to reveal the Father, God's will, God's purpose, God's design, and God's salvation in the realization of the atonement that God is going to provide for you once I die and rise from death. But literal, these words are meant for you to live. So he said, ask, and it shall be given to you. <gasps> oh, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Ask, ask. What do you think we ought to do? What should we do? What do you need to do? What should you always be doing? Ask. Is that prayer? God. I don't know. You could call it prayer if you want to. I just call it asking. Ask, and you shall receive. I don't need to add knocking and, you know, like, seeking. You know, each one of those expletives are command pre present tense. So, you know, if you want to look at it from a Greek word, I don't care. I'm not going to go there. I'm just saying in the English, it says ask. Ask doesn't mean asking. Keep on asking. The word says ask, and it shall be given unto you. It doesn't say ask first and then start seeking. There's not a time sequence there. There's no sentence structure in English that goes right to the sentence structure with a colon and then it says, Time sequentially of the you know ramifications of taking asking. Now we have to apply seeking to and knocking to so that we have a three part tri as tri unity of aspectation of the realization of taking the verbal with the you know and you know how they make up all these kind of things, you know. They make it sound so intellectually theological, you know, intelligent. It's stupid. Ask. Tell a child, ask me. And the child say, Okay, I'll ask. Hello? So Ask and it shall be given unto you. That's what we're talking about in James. We're learning wisdom. We're starting with the reality of where we should be in the last part so that we can apply wisdom to the first part. We need to ask. God, give us wisdom for James. God, give us understanding of James. God, help us to see James. God, help us to understand the Word of God. God, help us to know the Word of God. God, give us the Spirit of God that we might know the Word of God, that we might apply the Word of God, that we might learn from you. Hey, I just prayed for the scripture reading, didn't I? Woo! Are we spiritual or what? So you see, the Holy Spirit is teaching us because he's already commanded us to ask. You just got to ask for wisdom, that's all. When you're reading something, when you're looking at something, when you're listening to somebody telling you something, when you're asking and you're looking and you're hearing people tell you things, don't go with that only. You know, listen. Jesus said it. You know, listen to what the rabbis say. You know, watch what they do, but listen to what they say. He said, no. You watch them, but you listen, but you watch them. You listen, but you watch them. And that's what you really need to do with anyone. Listen, but watch them. Watch what they do with the word. Watch what, how they apply it. Do they apply it? Are they applying it at all? You know, if it says, let any man ask of, you know, let, you know, it says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who braided thought, but give down and deliver. If the Bible says that and we just taught on it, then where does the pastor go when he's trying to ask for wisdom? Does he come back to you with commentary? If I came back to you with a Chuck Smith commentary right after saying, ask of God for wisdom, and now, you know, I could try to spiritualize or I could try to cop out, you know, and pull a, Rom a Romanian, you know, and say, well, you know, 
I asked God for wisdom and He sent me to Chuck. Or I asked God for wisdom and He sent me over here. I asked God for wisdom and He sent me to, you know, the pulpit commentaries. Okay. Call me stupid, but I think in the book of Acts we see two different perspectives. We see a bunch of guys getting together who just got blessed in the Holy Spirit, you know, and they're full of God and they're full of themselves and they're full of the Holy Spirit and they're full of doing power and might and signs and wonders. Kind of like, you know, you see Christian television, Book of Acts. That's what happened with early church, man. They're right there doing their thing, you know, and they got sitting on, Peter sitting there on his throne, you know, and telling everybody what to do. Bring it all, you know, bring it on. Hey, look, you know, you didn't straighten up. Yeah, you're dead, you know, well, wiped out. But now we have somebody else out there, you know, in the boonies, you know, going, hey, you know, I'm killing them in the name of the Lord because they're wrong. Whatever they're doing, it's wrong. And God knocks them off his horse, sends them out in the desert, brings them back, sends them out and says, guess what? I want you to go do. And he teaches them because Paul asked God who give it to all men liberally. He didn't go to Peter. He didn't go to Paul. I mean Paul. He didn't go to Peter. He didn't go to James. He didn't go to John. He didn't come here to the church first. He went out because he went and talked to God about it. Then he went out. Is his doctrine right? Is his dogma right? Was he systematic, theologically correct? Well, not according to what was going on. I mean, after all, we have a poor fisherman, or rather, rather a drunk fisherman, who used to be a drunk, you know, sitting there, you know, in charge of the church. Well, he wasn't. James was. But, you know, we like to think that Peter was like, you know, head honcho. Peter was one of important people, but Jewish culture in those days was you got around in a kind of like a half a circle, you know, and you sat around and you kind of hashed out what was about going on. And that's what the book of Acts shows. These Jewish guys, you know, when they were full of the Holy Spirit, didn't do much different than what the Jewish rabbis were doing at the time, too. Sitting around, hashing it out, and talking it out, you know. They got around, sitting around, hashing it out, talking it out, and they picked the wrong, hopefully it's wrong, maybe it was right, don't know yet. But the wrong apostle. I personally believe that it was the wrong apostle, but, you know, well, you... Hey, you know, God might honor him and say, yeah, he's an apostle. And him, and him, and him, and him, and him, and him. Well, okay, no problem there, God. Your choice. But my point is this. If it says, ask of God for wisdom, why are you asking anyone else? You should be personally real with God, your God, in a personal, intimate way, having relationship of the Word, in the word that the wisdom of God comes to you by the Holy Spirit that you can say I am taught of God I am inspired by God I have the Holy Spirit in me to teach me we assemble ourselves together to listen to what someone else has learned so we're inspired to look at and to go alongside and come alongside the pastor as he's learning and you may know more than the pastor. You may be praying for that poor sucker. You know, and you may be praying, God, give him wisdom from the Word. You know, <laughs> I have done that with some pastors. You know, I mean, they'll tell me some weird thing, and I'll go, What can I say? If it ain't in there, it ain't right. And there are a lot of pastors, you know, they got opinions, you know. Man, if they start getting into politics again, the next election, I got a feeling you're going to have a lot more people, Christians, leaving the church than they left the last time pastors got into politics. Sorry, just saying. Well, so if we do get into wisdom, as it says in James 1.5, then we know that God is giving it to us. We know he'll give to all men liberally. And it says that he abrades not. He doesn't beat you up because you don't know. Or he doesn't beat you up for what you do know. He only gives it to you. He just says, I'll give it to you. I'm not going to say, you know, no. I'm not going to make you work at it. I'm not going to make you knock and seek. You know, I'm going to make you ask. That's all. And I'm going to give it to you. And once we say that it shall be given him, at the end of that line, what are you going to say? That it won't happen? Are you going to try to tell me that God doesn't speak? Are you going to try to tell me that you can't get wisdom? Are you going to try to tell me any other excuse at all except for what the Word of God says right here? It shall be given him. Ask. You know, the next line might say, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, but that's in verse 6 and we'll talk about that next week. <laughs> but for now, hey, God does speak. God has said, 
God will do. We know that by creation. We know it's true. So, if you don't have wisdom, you're stupid. Because <laughs> you could have it. All you got to do is ask. Now, going back to, we could look at James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James was somebody who was a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He was serving both. He served God. He served Jesus Christ. Now, who he's talking to is interesting. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. You could say he's writing this to the twelve tribes, or he says, James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. You could say, in my personal opinion, he's greeting the twelve tribes abroad. Because really, he wasn't thinking so much about Gentiles at that time, because, you know, it's kind of like, they were coming, but it wasn't quite well, really well established yet in James' mind. It wasn't really well established in a lot of their minds when they were writing these books. It's like, whoa, boy, Paul made sure they understood. So I don't think that, you know, there's a teaching out that says, oh, well, you know, that's written to the Jews. Uh, it don't matter for the Gentiles. No, we're not Jews. Well, I'll say, you know what? Jew or Gentile, it's written to you, dude. You know, because you want to beat yourself to death that we're pretending this is only written to the 12 tribes. Baloney. Sorry. Baloney. I think he was writing a greeting. He says, greeting to the 12 tribes. Hey, he was giving an honor to honor his due. The Father, the Son, the tribes. Wouldn't say Gentiles. Wouldn't say church. Because the 12 tribes would have been those that are following after God, the people of God. We would say in our day, modern day, the bride of Christ. Christendom. You know, Christianity as a whole. My brethren. Now you can get into that same old stupid argument about, well, he's just writing to the Jews again. Uh, the Gentiles, you know, doc, run, you know, ignore it. You don't got to do it. Because guess what? It's only written for them Jews who are chosen to suffer. <laughs> Good luck with that one. We'll see how it plays out for you. False! <laughs> Count it all joy. Ahoo! Wahoo! That's what it means. yippee ki -yay! woo -hoo! Yeah, that's what it means. It doesn't mean to sit down and go, well, I know it's going to work out. I know somehow it's going to be good. I know what it is, but right now it sucks. It's just miserable, it's making me miserable. I'm bummed out. I'm blown out, and I'm just buried in it. This sucks. Man, I want some misery. I want some sympathy. I want some comfort. I don't want no joy. God forbid I get joy in the midst of my trial. What am I going to do with that? Enjoy it? I like being miserable. Misery loves company. Don't you know I'm going to rewrite my movie proverb? Misery. 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 You know. Well, anyways. The reality is, you know what? I have been through the ridiculousness of the hopelessness of the situation with which God brings it to me and says, Michael... Not God, but the doctor. Okay, so I won't point to you. Yes, Doc. Doc says, you ain't living past 30. He says, you better get your house in order. You better get your affairs in order. You're not going to live. <laughs> really? <laughs> You're kidding, right? No. <laughs> cool. <laughs> wow. That's cool. You okay, Michael? No. Yeah, but you ever heard of Book of James? No, uh, you wouldn't understand. And I cracked up. Later on, you know, that night I kind of went, oh, bummer, man, you know, I don't get to do this and that and the other thing, you know, it's kind of a couple of things I was a little bummed about, you know, but at the time I was kind of like, hit me funny. Counting it all joy should be at some point in time you kind of think about something, you know, and you realize and you recognize, you know, what you got is so much more than what you're getting. The trials and tribulations with which we're talking about that you count it all joy when you fall into divers. Let's be careful about the words. Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Recognize that. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with that temptation also make a way to escape that you be able to bear it. You know, you get to duck out and duck and run or run around or do something else, but you don't have to be right there underneath it. So when somebody tells me something ridiculous, I know God's doing it. So it's like, doctor tells me I'm going to die. Okay, the Lord said, so I'm, I'm fine. I'm dead, man. I'm gone. I'm out of here. But you see, death, when I was told it, 
I knew wasn't the end of eternity. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it was like the beginning of eternity for me. Death would be the beginning of eternity. Man, I'm already living it because I'm already loving it and I'm not fearing it, so I'm looking forward to it and I'm going to it. So it's like, death, man, come on, let's get on with it because I'm ready for eternity. I'm living in eternity. I'm ready to go for eternity. I think it's going to be fun. <laughs> I think I see a lot of things happening in eternity that aren't happening here and now that I'm going to look forward to. And it's not just sitting around worshiping. <laughs> that's one aspect, but that's not the only thing. Sorry, you ain't just sitting around on a bunch of dumb clouds, you know, playing a harp like one sweet comfort band member said way back when. But the reality of what's going on in the universe and the things that God is revealing as he goes from ages to ages life is something that's going to be un unique and distinctive to each age that we go through. And we're going to constantly go through these ages that God is revealing himself and revealing his salvation and revealing the very aspect of himself as being God as love. And because he's so much bigger than we are, we have eternity to figure that one out and learn about and go about and do about and be about the unity of the body of Christ in him and with the Father and being one with God, the Father and Son and Spirit, which is going to wow, blow our minds first time it happens. Woohoo! You ever been one in the Spirit? Well, anyways. wrote a book about that. So, when I was told that I was trying to think of that. Oh, when I was walking in a grocery store line, that's the other one I was thinking of counting it all joy. I was walking in a grocery store line, and I was bummed. I was, I was, I was, I was bummed. There was no way that I was a boring Christian walking in a grocery store, because I had like, I don't know, dollar two to my name. <laughs> and I had 30 days to go before I get any more money, more food. I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I think it was Alaska, but I'm not sure. But I was in the grocery No, it wasn't. I was Climate Falls. That's right. I was always broke in Climate Falls, Oregon. So I'm not like no I'm like no money, no opportunity, no way that I'm gonna get anything. So I'm like hungry. And so God said to me or something, you know, as I was walking along, you know, I kinda was looking at all the meat. I walked up past the meat counter, you know, saw the meat. I was walking along, you know, through all the Pepsis and all the other things that were going on. And I thought to myself, Wow, look at all this stuff and all this opportunity there is with which I could be eating and I could be enjoying that with which God could give to me. But I only have a dollar, so I don't get the opportunity to do that. So I kind of got bummed. And then all of a sudden it hit me. God spoke to me, literally. I mean, he kind of he kind of hinted. He didn't really say it the words out loud, but he said, is this any way for the Son of God to act? I just started cracking up. He goes, is this any way for the air of the universe to be? And I thought, man, I looked around and said, they don't know that you know I'm living in eternity, man. I've got all this coming forward that I'm going to inherit I'm going to get all this junk. I mean, not the food, you know, but all this life, you know, more so abundantly that beyond what my present circumstances were, I got so much more. So I started laughing and carrying on. And that's what it means to count it all joy. Your joy is your strength. Look at your life now and figure out how strong you are or how wimpy and weak you are. Because the things of the spirit are not measured by the strength of arms. For it is not by chariots from Egypt or by the might of the Egyptian army or by the power of your sword or by the words of your mouth that you have the strength. No, it says the joy of the Lord's our strength. What? The joy of the Lord's our strength? How is that strength? It's your strength. You see, joy rejoices in the object of its joy. The rejoicing is knowing who you are rejoicing in and what. And that is God. So God is able to take your joy and use it as an avenue to which he will protect you so that you would be in constant worship and rejoicing of him. I don't know too many people that die in the middle of celebrating. I, I really don't. I mean, I've looked in the Old Testament, you know, and I see all these martyrs, you know, and they're singing on their way to death. I see Peter and Paul and James and John and all these other guys when they're in prison, they're singing and worshiping. I don't see them dying. I see them singing. I see them rejoicing. I see them in joy with strength. The joy of the Lord being their strength. They sang. It wasn't just singing, you know, it wasn't just worshiping like we get into like woo -hoo -hoo -hoo, but you know, or woo -hoo, you know, but singing, rejoicing, having joy. And that's what joy is, the demonstration of joy is rejoicing. But if the joy of the Lord is your strength, then count it all joy, it says. And that's where the strength is. If we are in joy, then, according to the scripture, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. When you 
are falling, when you have fallen, when you fall, not when you're almost falling. You fall into temptations. When you fall into temptations. It doesn't say when you are tempted. It doesn't say when you resist it. It doesn't say when you made it through or you see what to do. It says when you fall into temptations. Yeah, you didn't have to go there, but you got there, and now that you're there, guess what? Rejoice. Be in joy. Joy filled. Be joy. Count it all joy. Knowing this, that, hey, you just fell into temptation. You fell in it. You you, you got it on you. You're all splish splashed and looking back. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, I have a real interesting way of looking at faith, you know, because I'm kind of like a different kind of guy. Pardon me while I put my feet up on the table. When I talk about faith, I don't want to know a man who has no temptation. I don't want to know a man who's never fallen. I don't know. I don't even want to know what the man's going to do when he's righteous. I want to know what the man did when he fell down. I want to know what the man did when he was sloughing and scuffing and rolling around in the mud and the blood and the guck and the ick and the yuck. Because you know what? Anyone, when things are going right, looks bright. But my God, you know what I want to know is I want to know what the guy does when he's losing it. When he's in sin, does he have faith? Does he have faith that he's forgiven? Does he have faith to ask God for forgiveness? Does he know what to do when he falls into temptation? When he has fallen in it? When he's in it? Yeah, according to James, simple. Guess what? Laugh. <laughs> Rejoice! Hey! It's there for a reason. Of course you fell down. That's what you're supposed to do. You fall down, then you got faith. Because you're going to learn faith through it. You're going to learn not to do it by way of going through it. So do it to it. Get your faith up. Get your faith full. Get faith full to Him. And you won't fail or fall into temptation next time because you'll avoid the temptation. Jesus said in the prayer on the mount that we call Sermon on the Mount, they're really are these sayings of mine. He said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Don't get into near the temptation at all, but once you do, if you're there, you fell into it. I mean, temptation usually is going to get you. It's got you and it's going to pull you and drown you in it because it's going to come after you if you're open to it. And that's why temptation is there. Because it says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You're not going to win in this life. You are not going to be perfect. You are not going to be righteous. You are not going to be holy. And those are the three things that God said for you to do. Be righteous. Be holy. Be perfect. Oops. You're telling me that I can't? And you're telling me that God says do it? I'm saying you betcha. You betcha. Because now here's the issue. You have what you're told, you know what you can't do. How are you going to apply knowledge? How are you going to apply fact of matter and fact of nature together to come up with the conclusion of what you should do? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Oh, ask of God how you do it. Well, literally, God does it. Because you see... You can't be perfect. You can't be righteous. You can't be holy. God can make you righteous. God can make you perfect. God can make you holy. Wisdom is knowing that. Wisdom is coming to God and asking, God, make me righteous. Ask of God. You ask for wisdom, but ask for righteousness. Hey, God, make me righteous. He has, but you can ask him to. He'll cleanse you. If any man, if we confess our sins, he's faithful just for our sins, because we're all righteous. In other words, if you confess, hey, I, I did it. I'm, I'm, I fell into temptation. I blew it. I'm sorry. You know, forget the sorry part because God already knows you're not. You got caught. God, forgive me. God, cleanse me. God, take me and make me into what you want me to be, but remove from me the stain of my sin and don't let me suffer the consequences of my sin, even though you will. Sorry, but I still pray that. God, I don't want the consequences, but I still get them. Because the trying of your faith will produce patience. And it says that but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Because you see, what happens is that if you go and fall down enough times, you learn slowly but surely 
that your faith restores your relationship with God and that God loves you. You find by your faith in Him that He is faithful and you are not. You will gradually recognize that God will love you through all these circumstances of your life so that you'll automatically come to Him. And He'll gradually give you the ability and the capability to not be caught into temptation. That you'll enjoy these situations because when you're in it and you fail, you go, Oh, wow. Well, praise the Lord, man. You know, hey, that's cool. You know, I'm, I'm learning patience. I'm learning faith. God is going to make me perfect because if I go through it enough, if I finally figure out sooner or later what it's all about, I know God at that time will take His place in my life and it won't be about falling into temptation, but it'll be about calling upon the name of the Lord and being saved. That's the reality of why we can take the scripture and apply it physically, personally, emotionally, and devoutly to our situations in life every day. All of the volume of the book, believe it or not, applies in your life. You could live out the entire book of Genesis to Revelation in one day. Really. All the lessons that are learned, book by book. Chuck Smith did this one night and he went through every book of the Bible and he had a summation of it and what was being learned in the plan of salvation and the scarlet thread of redemption. It went all the way through from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And it blew my mind. I wanted that so bad that I wanted God to do that to me. And then one time I was teaching somewhere, some point in time, some night, you know, I forget what it was. And I went from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And I went, whoa. I didn't even know I could say all the books of the Bible. <laughs> so the reality of what God is trying to bring us to in this whole situation that James is talking about isn't trials, which most people take James and say, oh, no, don't read James, man. It's just, you know, you got to go through trials. Oh, no, don't go through James. It's, you know, about temptations, you know. Because it's really not about trials. It's a trying of your faith in some ways, but really about temptation, falling into temptation, failing. Because you do. You're going to fail. It's really about practicality of the reality of using spiritual truth to prove that the things of the Spirit are practical. The Word of God is practical. The spiritual aspects of our life are practical as long as we don't try to take a practical solution to it because it's a spiritual reality. You're trying to solve a spiritual problem with a practical application and it can't be done. The practical application is using the spiritual reality to do what God says to do, which is better to... to obey is better than sacrifice and the obedience to that obeisance is right here. Not to make a sacrifice of enduring the trial, but to obey what God said. Ask Him for wisdom. Ask of God, who abradeth not, but giveth to all men liberally. And it shall be given Him. The reality of our life will always be about who do you turn to? Where do you turn to? What do you do? Most of the first responders since the huge impact that 9-11 had and other situations and circumstances that they began to look at circumstances of life and say maybe we shouldn't dive right in when we see something wrong and try to save the person maybe if I'm not a swimmer I shouldn't try to go and rescue the person and he drowns me and him because that's the first thing you're taught in saving someone when they're drowning they're liable to drown you <laughs> If you don't know how, don't do it. Get a pole. Get somebody else. Grab somebody. But don't try to save them until they're done struggling. Then pull them out. And give them mouth to mouth. But the point is this. Now they've been teaching people in first responders classes and in you know those things to stop, look, evaluate. Evaluate the circumstances. Don't just dive in. You don't run into a burning building to save someone if the roof is that close to collapsing and killing you. Now there may be a you know debatable about how much of you know roof you got left, but you need to know. Well, wait a minute. That roof you know is nothing compared to that tanker truck that's parked right next to the roof that's getting ready to blow up the block. Hello. Guess what? You pulled the guy out onto the porch and he's out from the burning building and he got blown up by the tanker that just took out the block. You didn't make it, did you? Either way, you fail. So you evaluate the circumstances. You say. Oh, and then you see what you need to do. So it's not just immediately dive in and rescue. It's not immediate rescue. You evaluate. You look at it. You know. You uh, you take stock of the situation. Because again, it's the same thing. You know, if there's a cell phone sitting there, 
you know, and somebody's dying, you know, do you call 911, you know, and get the number started and then apply first aid, or do you just go ahead and start applying first aid and never call the person, you know, for help? You know, because the guy may have other issues that needs to be addressed by someone else that's a better responder than you are, and you only have a limited knowledge. There's always that recognition that you need to ask, evaluate, take stock of, and to use wisdom. And that's what God wants you to do spiritually. He wants you to be so spiritual minded, you're all earthly good. That you take stock of the scriptures. You take evaluative courses and look at what it's saying. You apply it in life and you say, well, how does this work? And has it worked for me? I've fallen down a lot, you know, but I've only been bummed every time I fall down. What if I tried rejoicing in it? What if I tried to being joy-filled? What if I tried laughing about it? What if I tried having faith that God is going to forgive me? That God is going to lead me? That God is going to direct me? That God is going to take me through it? That God, I could ask Him even now and He's going to give me wisdom about it so I would know what to do with it. Whoa, if I ask God, He might even tell me. So you see, there's more to this thing we call Christianity than sucking our thumb, sticking our fingers in our ears, closing our eyes and, you know, zipping the lip, you know, and saying, I got faith. Uh-uh. No, you don't. You don't have faith until you've been in it and you're of it and you're buried in it and you're doing it and suddenly, you know, you're looked around and people are watching you because you're in the midst of a mess and you're laughing about it. I almost dare say that, you know, the children that were of the children of Israel when they were in the fire, they might have been laughing. Maybe not, but you know they, they were definitely roasted marshmallows. I know because I saw it in there. Okay, maybe they weren't roasted marshmallows, <laughs> but their clothes weren't toasty. They didn't smell. They wasn't stinking thinking. They had it, and they said, "Well, I don't care if I die. I don't care if I live. Hey, you know, dying or living, God's still the same." And that's the thing that we need to recognize when we're in James, when we're in these scriptures, and we're in the Word of God. God didn't change any. He loved you then. He loves you now. He'll love you in the future. God is love. Now, the wisdom of how God loves you is what you need to ask Him about. And that's when you'll find out why He loves you, how He loves you, and why that love will never change. And I think you're going to learn that as we study the book of James and as we grow through it, going from now, we've gone through one through, oh, I don't know, four, maybe five. And then we're going to get into five and six because, you know, they, they're tied together. But, you know, one through five, that, hey... There's a reason why he loves you. And in one respect, it's, you know, a little bit to do with you. You know, you're kind of nice. You know, you stink. You know, you're, you know, kind of like full of sin. You know, you're carnal. You're mushy. You're gushy. You suck wind when it comes to righteousness. But it's because of Jesus, which makes me <laughs> crack up because that means that it's not according to anything I've done, you know, that God loves me. But it has everything to do with why he loves me because of what Jesus has done for me. And that makes me so reassured, so comforted, and so confident that I can count it all joy when I do fall and when I fall into temptation.